Hello, everybody. Can you become a grandmaster by simply solving thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of tactical puzzles? Is the tactical puzzle training enough to take any player and make him or her a chess master? Today's video might be a little bit controversial for some of you, but I am very happy that we will discuss this very important topic. It's wide to play in this position. And while I'm going through and telling you all the details about this, this video, you can already, let's say, try to find a good move for white in this position. So the idea for this video came about by two comments I received on my previous videos. The first one was something like this. He said, it doesn't matter. You're talking about all these different areas of the game, you know, positional chess, end games, openings. No, just solve 1 million puzzles or more. I forgot the actual number, actually. And anyone can become a GM, he said, even adult improvers, right? But then, of course, right, no one has time to solve all these puzzles. It's just crazy number that he gave. So he was changing the goalpost, you see. So he was like, yes, that's a solution. That's how you become a master, but no one can solve so many tactical puzzles. Thus, that's why we don't see adult improvers showing improvements and amazing success stories, right? In his, in his or her mind, this was the main problem. The limitation was the number of puzzles you need to solve, and no one has time for that. The second comment I recently received, he said that since more people are playing chess these days, they are playing chess like a video game, they are solving so many, so many more puzzles than previous generations. And yes, they are getting better, but that's mainly due to them solving so many more puzzles than before. This is the claim. This is the claim. And he even referenced, you know, Daniel Narodisky, who said, if you want to become a good chess player, then you need to be good at puzzle rush. So he was using that reference to say that it's the whole story. Solve puzzles, do puzzle rush, and you will get better in chess. Now, I'm not saying that tactical training is not important. Obviously, it's very important. Tactical vision, good tactical eyes, is always going to help you. Because chess is fundamentally a tactical game. I agree with that. Tactics are always involved in chess, right? The short-term gain in material, for example, using tactical patterns. Very important tools in your disposal, folks. But in this video, I will tell you that there is more to chess and chess improvement than only tactical puzzle training, folks, right? I will also tell you potential limitations and drawbacks if you only use your chess study time for solving tactical puzzles. Now, go back to this position. It's white to move. White in this position has an amazing knight on d6, don't you think? It's an amazing piece. That piece is worth more than a rook in that position. Beautiful outpost, centralized, really dominating the entire board. But white player had a great tactical eye. And thus, he went knight takes f7, takes, bishop takes c6, because this you can easily get in a tactical puzzle book, right? Because go back to the initial position, white sees, hmm, I can take on f7, I can win a pawn, right? And then I can capture the knight. And he can see, of course, that because of the pin, the bishop cannot be recaptured. Now, the question is, was this a good decision for white? And this is the gist. It was not, because this knight was the king of the entire board. And suddenly, for only sake of a single pawn, you're giving away your beautiful knight, and suddenly black position is not so terrible anymore after takes, takes, and d6. Because he will activate his bishop, this rook is going to d7, and black surely is very happy to see that knight on d6 disappear. Going back, folks, what is the main lesson here? The main lesson is, yes, tactics are important, you should have a great tactical eye, and you should spot these tactical opportunities relatively quickly, but it doesn't mean that you should always go for it. It doesn't mean that, for example, extra material in this case, is not great for white. This, you need a positional evaluation, right? You need to see that line and you need to evaluate in your mind's eye the resulting position. 
right? Was it good for White to give up knight on d6 like that for a single pawn? And the answer is no. And this actually requires, right, strategic understanding, positional factors, evaluation of the positions. I have an up upcoming chessable course on this very topic, folks. It's the connection between material, quality, and time in chess. In this case, white is winning material, yes, but white is losing the quality of the position, yeah, because that knight was giving the white position so much quality, and it's not worth it, right? So this you can't get in puzzle books, because if you go to a puzzle book, tactical puzzle book, only thing you get usually is, is a position like this. And yes, I see the tactic, yes, I win a pawn, and the puzzle just quits, right? I'm finished, I'm done. I'm successful, but in actual games, it can be totally the other way around, right? You can go wrong by winning a pawn in an actual game using tactics. The best move for white in this position was, can you guess it? Yes, beautiful d4, because white intensifies the pressure on black's position. Black's pieces are all paralyzed. Just look at the black army, folks. Just look at the pieces. Crazy passive and bad pieces. Full positional domination for white. The pawn is totally irrelevant for this. And go b4, b5, and it's collapsing. It's actually just a winning advantage for white. Here, let's say the worst piece is this. How do you activate this? Bishop a3, right? Very logical. The bishop joins the action. Now that rook is also suffering. And every single white piece is dominating the entire board. Don't you think? Winning advantage for white. Like plus 5 or something in this position. I'm not kidding. But this requires a positional judgment. Let's continue with the second position. Imagine this position, black goes king d7. The question is, what should white do? This is a very interesting position to me, because you don't usually get such positions, such puzzles or problems in normal tactical puzzle books. Normal, usual tactical puzzle books don't show you the opponent's last move, usually, right? So you don't have this extra information of what has changed recently, right? Am I, for example, facing a threat as a result of the opponent's last move? But all these questions are vital for you when you're playing the actual chess game, right? So here is a big claim. Tactical puzzle books can be a little bit artificial, right? They don't always resemble a gameplay situation. They don't directly simulate a real game situation, which is the goal of your training, right? I assume you want to get better in real OTB or online chess game. So we also need to be aware, right, of such discrepancies. And in this case, after King D7, you tell me, what is the threat that White is facing? In this case, that's a positional threat, obviously, right? This is the threat. He wants to take over the A file, double up the rooks and dominate the board. So, what should white do? Beautiful, if you found rook a1, anticipating rook a8, and after rook a8, you tell me the only move for white in this position. Yes, rook ff1, that's the only way for white to keep challenging the a file, and thus, white keeps equality. And this is also very important, folks. Normal tactical puzzle, puzzle books, you are almost always getting an advantage, right? Playing for an advantage. But in an actual game, right? You don't always play for an advantage, right? Sometimes your goal is to simply get an equal position. And that's exactly also what is presented in this puzzle for you. This resembles a real game situation than normal tactical puzzle books, folks. So you see how important goal setting is for chess, for chess calculation. That's also exactly what you get in such beautiful, to my mind, they are very beautiful problems. Um, because seeing the threat is always going to be with you, such questions in actual games. By the way, I have an upcoming chessable course about this very topic. The opponent's last move. In every single position, you will be presented by the opponent's last move. And you need to identify tactical or positional threats you are facing. Or tactical or positional drawbacks of that last move. In the actual games, folks, tactics and strategy, they are always intertwined. They are always connected. You cannot separate them. You should actually use tactics, generally, to serve 
your strategy. You should always have some sort of general plan, general strategic idea of what to do in the position. And you're using small tactics, short term plays to help your strategic goal. That's how masters play chess. But if you only do puzzle rush, if you only do tactical training, then this strategic aspect might be missing in your game entirely, right? Because again, tactical training books, they just give you a position and uh, you just need to find a small tactic to win material. So that strategic goal setting, plan making is usually missing in such puzzles. But again, in real games, you always need that. They're always pressed. Take this position. It's white to play fox. Can you please find a good move for white? Relying on tactics serving your strategic goal. And that was my little hint for you, little support. Congratulations if you first of all spotted that d3 pawn is a backward and weak pawn that white will love to get rid of strategically. So, tell me the move. Beautiful d4. It looks like an unplayable move, but think again, white is using tactics to make this move work. Isn't it beautiful? Because if black takes the pawn, then there's the pawn fork on a5. And I love such examples, again, because they resemble a real game situation perfectly. And you see, right, the role of tactics. Tactics, in this case, are, is a servant for our strategic goal. Our strategic goal, as I said, is to get rid of a weakness in the position. And we are using small tactics to justify it. Again, I have an upcoming chessable course about this. It will be called Fundamentals of Chess Calculation. And there are so many such positional puzzles for you, right? Again, the idea is to simulate a real game environment as much as possible, while also showing you the role of tactics and strategy in this nice interconnected way box. Another aspect of chess that tactical puzzle books are usually neglecting is the feeling for a critical moment in chess, right? Or knowing, for example, who benefits in the long term and who benefits in the short term, which means who have a long-term advantage and who has a short-term advantage. In other words, do I have a time advantage that I must use in a very timely way? For example, in this position, it's white to play box. I want you to see the whole board, set your goal, orient yourself to the imbalances here, which is also, by the way, sometimes missing in tactical puzzle books, and create a plan for white plays. Folks, this is a beautiful game of Gelfand. And if you look at the static structures here, right? White's pawn structure is weakened. And black has this beautiful e5 outpost for his knight. If you give black time, he will get knight e5, bishop g4, for example, rook f8, and black will have an amazing position. Also, look at the white pieces currently, right? This knight is really, really dominated in this position. There's no real active square. This bishop is also quite poor. And, but what is going on for white's favor is time advantage, don't you think? White's pieces are momentarily better developed. This means white needs to act fast before it gets too late. And this is totally about your strategic general judgment of the position in terms of time, statics, and dynamics. So Gelfand, of course, he sees all this and he goes e5. It's a beautiful move, folks. It's a multi-purpose move, creating e4 square for the knight and uh, hitting the rook in a very timely fashion. d takes e5. Well, if he, if he takes with the knight in his position, then knight e4 followed by knight d6. And white is just in time, right? to get the pieces to much better squares and doesn't let black to get the pieces out and white keeps an advantage in this position. So in the actual game, it takes back the deep pawn, but now, right, there is no more knight e5 outpost to begin with. My rook has become more active and my knight has gained the e4 outpost. That's a beautiful short sequence, of course, followed by c5 because Gelfand also wants to activate this guy, right? Suddenly look at the shift. Look how things have changed in two moves. And masters, they are actually great in spotting such moments, which is also missing in usual tactical training books, right? Because think again, in a tactical training book, it's almost always a critical moment, right? You're about to win something. Oh, it's critical. That means you need to like spend your resources and time and find that very best move. 
But in the actual game, no one is telling you, right? No one is telling you that this is a critical moment. You need to figure out yourself. And finally, folks, I want to talk about the importance of the build-up stage in chess. Because normally, in tactical puzzle books, you have no idea how that position came about, right? There is no history. They don't tell you, they don't show you how a player has built up that beautiful position that led to a tactic, a winning tactic. In chess, tactics favor good positions. So if you have a great build-up, then usually tactics start favoring you. But we need this type of build-up training as well, right? To become a better player. Otherwise, there is no chance that we get those beautiful positions. In fact, Rudolf Spielmann, he was a great tactical genius. He said he can see Alexander Alekhin's combinations as fast and as efficient as Alekhin himself. The problem is that he couldn't get his positions. He couldn't get Alekhin's positions in his games, right? The importance of the build-up stage. Check this game. It's a beautiful game of Magnus Carlsen. What should white do? The queens are facing each other. Should white exchange the queens? If not, where should the white queen go, folks? And take your time. It's a beautiful positional puzzle. I want you to come up with a multi-purpose move in this position. Congratulations if you found the beautiful move queen d2, which was found by Carlsen. Just look how many ideas this move presents. Incredible beauty. Yeah, I find this moves beautiful because look, bishop d4 is no longer possible. This bishop is totally out of the game. There is nothing going on that diagonal. This bishop is sadly missed in defense because the black king is not safe. That's also why Carlson kept the queens on the board, right? The black king is more exposed. Second pro issue for black, there is no more rook d8. After queen d2, I am also stopping rook d8. So look how many things this move does. No bishop d4, no rook d8. And finally, this queen also keeps, keeps an eye on the weakness on h6. Thus, the build-up stage starts. From now on, white starts orienting his, all of his pieces on the king's side. For the final action. Check this game out, folks. Carlson Etienne Bacro, knight e4. Nice. Tactics is involved. Can this knight be captured? Well, you tell me. If you take the knight, then Carlson's queen d2 move makes perfect sense again, right? And now it's just mate in three. Beautiful. So Carlson is position is using tactics to justify his strategic goal, right? Because his strategic goal is to get every single piece on the king side. And that knight is the final guy that is missed in the attack, right? So again, just look how they are intertwined. Tactics and strategy in real, real chess. In real world chess, folks. Knight e4, beautiful move. We should be 7 and then comes rook h3. Forcing move. Black must do something about the pawn. King g7. Queen d7. Well, the bishop is pinned, right? Step by step, Carlson improves every single piece. After king f7. Again, this position you can get in a puzzle book, folks. So, I want you to stop the video and find Carlson's combination, please. You know what they say in chess? Tactics flow from good positions. White actually reached a maximum potential for every single piece in this position. So, we should start looking for forcing solutions, forcing combinations, because we deserve it, right? Usually in chess, once one side gets every single piece to their maximum you know, square, then tactics are usually favoring them. So, congratulations, folks. If you found Carlson knight g5, a very forcing move, well, you cannot take with the h pawn because the queen hangs after f takes g5, forcing move rook f3, forcing move queen e6, and then forcing move rook f7, right? Like four forcing moves in a row, and black is actually forced to capitalize because the queen is overworked, right? The queen is overworked on h6, otherwise, you get mated. So black has to give up the queen. And the rest is technique for a player like Magnus Carlsen. I will show you very quickly. Oh, I love this move. He's just tucking his king on the corner on a2, preventing all counterplay. And now the f1 is running and black resigned. Guys, I love such examples. And I actually even made a course about this on Chessable. The art of multi-purpose moves, right? Look how multi-purpose this queen d2 move is. This is the essence of good chess to me. This is what I find beautiful, right? There's more to chess than only tactical puzzles, folks. Please, deeper in the ocean, I'm waiting for you.
Thank you for bearing with me today, folks. I hope I made my points clear. Again, it doesn't mean that tactical training is not important. Please don't get me wrong. You need to work on your tactics in a regular basis, daily basis, because tactical vision, tactical sharpness is always going to help you in your games. Yeah, because on the basis, chess is a very tactical game. You can lose a great strategic game due to random tactic. So our, we must raise our floors and tactics are definitely useful for that. But this is not the whole story. This according to me, there's much more to chess than simple tactical puzzle books. And please send me feedback and comments on YouTube. Join this discussion and maybe we can brainstorm a new video idea in the future. Hope you liked it. Please give me a like so we can reach more people. And you can also check my chessable courses as mentioned, upcoming ones and also the current ones. They're all about other beautiful things about chess that I show you today, folks. Bye-bye.